So anyway, why don't we start uh, with Ben. Uh, you have your program, so I'm not going to belabor the introductions, but we just know that Ben um, was a New York boy, and he thought going to the Manhattan Project was really cool because he could go back home. What did you discover? Well, I wasn't, I didn't exactly end up in Manhattan, but uh, at least, at least um, I ended up in the Manhattan Project. Um, as with many, uh, out, any other, many of, of uh, the soldiers there, I was part of what's called the SED, the Special Engineering Detachment, which originally, the name originally actually originated from the Manhattan District, which really was in Manhattan. Uh, the way, the way I, I got into Los Alamos, similar to what other, other soldiers did, uh, had, had got in, was simply by an interviewing board, which, which went to my original place where I was uh, studying uh, to be a tail gunner on the B-17. B uh, I was interviewed because I was a physics major at City College in New York. Um, uh, they plucked me out of out of uh, my uh, training as a tail gunner. I ended up therefore at Los Alamos. Uh, my first job w was uh, to work on something called a jumbo, which was nothing but a, a large container, and the, the purpose of the container was to, was to contain the implosion bomb in case it fizzled, because if it fizzled, it would scatter radioactive material all over New Mexico. Uh, uh, but after I got my security clearance, I ended up uh, working on, on, a, on the triggers for the implosion bomb, the Nagasaki bomb. I worked with a leader, uh, Donald Hornig, uh, a professor of chemistry at um, Berkeley, and in incidentally, it, it's very in interesting to note uh, that perhaps because of the influence of Robert Oppenheimer, that the, the research and development at Los Alamos was very similar to that of a graduate school. There were senior physicists from all over the world, very distinguished physicists, uh, and then there were the the assistants like myself and, and many others who um, uh, were the hands of, of the senior physicists, just like graduate students. It's sort of like a graduate school. And, um, and, and in fact, it, was a, it, it served as a training ground for many, many um, people who be later be, uh, became physicists and chemists and, other, and mathematicians in their, in their careers. Uh, the the uh, um, alumni of the Special Engineering Detachment is really a very dis has a, some very distinguished members in it, including a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, but uh, th I think we'll talk we'll talk about more of that tomorrow. Uh, anyway, I ended up working on the triggers for the Nag for the Nagasaki bomb. Uh, after a while, we our experiments were completed. I uh, worked with with the crew of the uh, Nagasaki plane to help them uh, get become familiar with the uh, electronics, and then I went to Titi and helped test the switches themselves in the laboratory that we constructed there, and uh, uh, chose chose the switches and. Uh, uh, that, that basically uh, finished my job because uh, once once the switches were selected, I, I had finished my work and I spent the rest of the time at, in, in the, the Manhattan Project waiting for my army discharge. The next is uh, Bob Brown. Quite a bit of what he said applies to me also. I... Uh, had just started college, then had to go in the Army, uh, Air Corps, and then 
had the good fortune to be sent to study electrical engineering for nine months at Ohio State. I was delighted with the mountain setting of Los Alamos. I too, or well, I at first worked in an electronic construction service group, building equipment for people on different projects. But then uh, I was in the same group that Ben mentioned, that is I uh, worked for Donald Hornig and it was on electronics of the electrical part of the detonation of the spherical Nagasaki bomb. I, uh, like a number of us, were down at the initial test in the desert. In fact, uh, I more or less at the last minute hooked a few measurement related devices to the uh, bomb. And uh, in fact, our boss, Don Hornig, was the last person to be there since. Oppenheimer had asked him to baby, babysit the bomb when the test had to be postponed because of an electrical storm. <laughs> Many of us were worried that something might not work, and in fact, a so-called rehearsal was held during an electrical storm, and uh, something misfired that Don Hornig had requested not to have this rehearsal during the electrical storm. It turned out there was a big rush because of wanting to know about the bomb, Truman wanting to know at the Potsdam conference. Anyway, many of us uh, were not so much worried that we'd get blown up in the first test as worried that one of many things might possibly go wrong, and we're so glad that a few things worked. We're in suspense. Did it work? Huh? I said uh, we're in suspense. Did uh, it work? <laughs> that really was quite something, given all the the moving parts and all of the things that have never been tried before that actually did perform. Um, Norm Brown, would, going alphabetically, would you like to speak next? How I got onto the uh, project. Uh, was I was um, into the Army in the enlisted sophomore year at MIT. Then eventually I got to uh, uh, specialized training program. Uh, one day two officers came on a special project where they learned to work at the bench and work and they talked about it. And um, I was interested. And, um, finally, I ended up at Oak Ridge for about a month doing the training work. Mud and a few walkways on the air mud. And uh, eventually, I got assigned to Los Alamos. I went, when, when uh, I arrived there, I was interviewed and told the interviewer, you know, what had happened to me. And uh, he said, oh, we have, a, we have a man here who used to teach at MIT. And he told me his name, and it turned out to be the man that had taught one of the uh, problem sessions. And he took me to see, he took me to see him, and I eventually got assigned to to.
How was that? Any better? I'll try to keep it this way. <laughs> anyway, eventually I was assigned to Arthur C. Wall, who ran the uh, wet chemistry group, and uh, had a, another GI colleague, Jim Gergen, and he and I built the apparatus according to Art Wall's design, uh, where, of course, we, co we control every step of the chemical purification process remotely with uh, rods sticking out of a glass cabinet that was about as big as a telephone booth. <coughs> and he, he, we purified all the plutonium that went into Alamogordo and the uh, Nagasaki bomb. And there was no more plutonium left. And uh, <coughs> the, when, when the bombs were scheduled, uh, the Alamogordo test was scheduled to go off, we walked all the way down the mesa and climbed up on the roof of a new building that had just been finished but not, not put in use and spread out our sleeping bags with an alarm clock to wake us up when, when we knew the test was going to be going. And uh, the, uh, we had begged and begged our Art Wall to let us go to witness, witness the test there. And he said he couldn't, he just couldn't do it because we had no role other than just observers and we were mere GIs. So uh, uh, Jim and I uh, set the alarm clock, we woke up and Nothing happened. So we started to walk back to the walk back on the mesa, looking uh, to our left, which was south. And uh, we, the daylight uh, broke finally, and we kept every uh, cross street we crossed. We looked we looked south, and at one cross one time we looked south, and the sun rose in the south. And <laughs> We realized it wasn't the sun. The sun doesn't rise in the south. So we knew that the, that the test had worked. Anyway, uh, uh, people keep mentioning uh, Don Hornig. And by some strange chance, when I went, uh, after I finished and went uh, uh, at MIT after the war, and uh, then I went to Brown University for graduate school. And I had a laboratory. And right next door was Don Horning's office. Uh, so I got to know Don and Lily uh, reasonably well. And <clears throat> uh, I never told, we, had a, we have a very good friend, a Japanese friend who lives in Tokyo. And when we went to Japan and visited uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki memorials, I had never told our Japanese friend what my role was at Los Alamos. And with great trepidation, we met her in Tokyo uh, after our visit to the two memorials. And with great trepidation, I told her what my role was in purifying plutonium. And to my surprise and delight, she was not disturbed because she said that uh, she was born after the war. Her father had told her all about uh, what, what had gone on. And she said that um, the Japanese knew that they had lost the war long before they gave up. And uh, even after the first bomb uh, was dropped, they re the generals absolutely refused to give up. And it took the second bomb to make them give up. But she said that everybody in Japan uh, knew that they had already lost the war because they had 14-year-old kids and younger whose job was to make uniforms. And every day they reported to the factory and sat behind the sewing machines and did nothing because they had no material to make uniforms from. So uh, it was just the stubbornness of the military uh, and the fear uh, the emperor, that uh, he would be either executed or exiled or something. And finally, when the peace treaty was signed, the emperor was saved. And uh, uh, a after the 
almost dropped. It was, I was still in Los Alamos. And everywhere we walked uh, in um, Albuquerque, when we had these, the GIs all, uh, were, who were coming out of the general hospital there came up to us. And uh, I see you have on the cap of your, on your cap the, the ah, you too. <laughs> The shoulder patch that we all wore, and uh, uh, people would come up to up to us on the streets of uh, uh, Albuquerque and thank us for having stopped the war because it saved them from going to going to Japan uh, for what was sure to be a slaughter. So, uh, I, as bad as the Feelings I had about the uh, the the uh, casualties and the kind of casualties uh, in Japan, uh, we felt that maybe something good had come out of it. So, I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is. Bob, Robert Carter. Is that working? Okay. Um, well, my name is Robert Carter. I, uh, I graduated with a major in physics from a little college in 1942 and went almost immediately to Purdue University in Indiana to teach. Uh, electricity, actually, to enlisted men in the, in the U.S. Navy who, after they graduated from our program, uh, most of them went almost immediately on shipboard and were, uh, were electricians uh, for repairing and maintaining uh, electrical systems on shipboard. Um, but um, when, I was, when I first went to Purdue, in 1942, um, I met up with a graduate student who was working at a nuclear physics machine called a cyclotron. And I had heard about cyclotrons, but had never seen one. So I asked, hey, take me there and show me this thing, which he did. And the faculty member in charge of the cyclotron uh, introduced himself. And we talked for a while. And he kind of invited me to come and help out uh, on their work at the cyclotron, which I did. And so uh, we started work. I started working as sort of an unpaid volunteer, uh, doing odds and ends around the cyclotron while they were doing nuclear physics research. And very within a couple of months, they the people at Purdue the faculty members at Purdue uh, got a contract with uh, an office that Ben Arbor, ben Arbor Bush was in charge of, the, uh, the Office of Scientific Research and Development. And this was a, a nuclear physics project related in a loose way to the Manhattan Project, which had not yet been started. So for about a year, we worked on that project. In the meantime, the Manhattan Project was started, Los Alamos Laboratory was started, and uh, the uh, four staff members, faculty members at Purdue, with whom I was working, all moved out west. And they told me, hey, Bob, we're leaving. We're going to go west. But they couldn't tell me where they were going. <coughs> or for what purpose, but within about a month after they disappeared from Indiana, I got letters from two of them, and they said, Bob, come on out here. This is the place you ought to be. And so within another month, I moved to Los Alamos. That was in, in uh, 1943, and so, uh, then I, so I, I joined the staff at Los Alamos and uh, as a civilian. And w the group 
that I joined was working on the design and construction and ultimate operation of a, a unique nuclear reactor. And uh, some of you know what a reactor is. It's a, it's a self-sustaining chain reaction based on the uranium fission process. And uh, the fission process of uranium is when a neutron goes into a uranium nucleus and energizes it and causes it to split apart into two or possibly uh, more pieces. And a lot of energy is formed and uh, was actually the, the basis of the nuclear bombs. Now, um, we worked on, on the design of this uh, nuclear reactor, and as I mentioned, it was, it was a new, unique one. None, none had yet been been built of that type, and so we did that. And somehow or other, I was designated what I later called the designated driver of this, op of this operation, and I was at the control, controls of it while we were doing the various measurements approaching uh, what's called criticality. And at the last day, uh, before we went critical, before it was a self-sustaining chain reaction, um, we made a prediction that the following day we would achieve criticality. And I was at the controls and I was I was running the uh, controls to get the machine operating, and my supervisor leaned over to me and he said, "Hey Bob, why don't you let Enrico take it for me, uh, critical?" Now Enrico was Enrico Fermi, and he was sitting at my elbow on my right, and I had already taught him how to operate the controls. Uh, maybe unfortunately, but anyway, so I turned to Enrico Fermi and I asked, would you like to take it critical? And uh, uh, Enrico Fermi was, uh, was a unique guy, uh, had, a, had a wonderful grin and a, and a neat little commentary kind of thing, and he said, oh, would I? And so I slid away from, from the controls and Enrico slid into position, and, uh, and he took the facility critical. And uh, there were, uh, the, the word had gone around the lab that we were going to go critical that day, and so uh, a large fraction of the world's outstanding scientists were standing there in our control room uh, watching and waiting for this event to occur. Anyway, it finally did, and everything worked okay. Um, within, within a few months, uh, Enrico Fermi and a small group moved from the so-called metallurgical laboratory at the University of Chicago out to Los Alamos, and Enrico Fermi took over the sort of management of, of the group I was working in. And, uh, and so from then on, for, uh, in 19, starting in, in early 1944, um, Enrico Fermi was kind of my mentor, my, my leader. And so kind of on a day-by-day -day basis, I worked then with Enrico Fermi for almost a year uh, bef until the, t the time of the war. Uh, was ended. Um, I, among other things, I, uh, I helped Enrico Fermi determine the, the critical uh, size of the first uh, nuclear bomb uh, to be tested and the, and the second nuclear bomb to be used on uh, uh, on Japan, um, I, I also attended and observed the first 
nuclear test in New Mexico, uh, what was called the Trinity shot. And in fact, I, I brought with me a little piece of the, of the soil uh, under the bomb. The bomb was set off on a tower about 100 feet high. And the, the, when the bomb detonated, it produced sufficient energy to melt the sands on the soil below. And uh, later on, a small group at Los Alamos uh, collected some of the sands, and, and a small group uh, embedded them, some of them, in a, in a plastic. And I have, I have one of these with me that uh, the, the people who made them uh, gave, me, gave me one of those. And, I, and I've kind of carried it around with me over the years. It's slightly radioactive. It's almost as radioactive as a person is. <laughs> and uh, as, as you probably, some of you know, uh, we all have some radioactive elements in our bodies, in our bones and things. And so we irradiate our neighbor a little bit. Uh, when, and he, he irradiates, me, irradiates me back. So, but there's about that much radioactivity residual still in this piece. Um, the, uh, I don't know that there's much more I can say. I, well, after the, after the war uh, was over, um, I stayed for uh, two or three months at Los Alamos. Then I moved to the University of Illinois um, uh, did some graduate work, and then uh, late, later moved back to Los Alamos and worked there for about another 15 years. Uh, some, some of the work I did was related to the fission bomb program, but most of it was more basic fundamental nuclear research, not, not directly related to the, uh, to the ongoing bomb program, which continues to these days. So I, I guess about, that's, that's about all that, uh, that comes to mind. Uh, I, I, had, I also brought with me, although it's not going to be possible to show it around, uh, a picture of, uh, that in, includes a photograph uh, that includes Enrico Fermi and me uh, when we were on a ski trip. And uh, I guess I should mention a lot of us did a lot of skiing uh, uh, in the good snows out in the southwest during the uh, couple of years of the Manhattan Project out there. Thank you very much. That was great. I know many of you are probably familiar with Sawyer Hill, uh, Perito Hill, where um, George Kikowski helped clear the trees from the would-be ski slope just by, you know, he was the explosive expert. Who but? So he had this little daisy chain of, dyna of uh, dynamite uh, to take them down, and it worked just fine. Uh, the physicists at work. Um, we have um, another speaker about uh, Los Alamos, Rex Keller. Maybe Rex and you and Bob can switch chairs or you can set that up, make sure we hear you. Uh, Rex Keller is my name, and I went to work at Los Alamos in July of 43, and my friend uh, Ralph Nobles, Got my brother a job there you know, in the spring, and Ralph got out from Chicago. He went to work with Fermi in 1942, and uh, my brother worked for Kennedy's chemistry group, and I wound up with Seth Nedemeyer's group on implosion. And some of the people didn't think the implosion idea of Seth would work, so we had to do a lot of experiment, and I worked a lot up on the hill at what's called K-Site, 
and we uh, put together and uh, would get explosives and so forth and put different cores in there and they'd touch them off and take pictures and see how the compression was. I was working one day and Fermi came out and most people I talked to thought Enrico Fermi was their best man. And uh, he came over, there was no one else out there but m myself working on a project. And he was very congenial and a friendly sort of guy and you'd never guess that he was <laughs> possibly the best that we had. It's a lot different in science from the military. The military works from the top down, and in science, you never know who's going to have the next best idea. And I guess Seth had that idea of implosion, and I know Pistikowski said that he did. And uh, we had to make a lot of tests, but they finally decided that the implosion would work, and that was the Trinity site but they had ordered a big steel casting out of Cleveland and the casting was there in case the uh, material didn't go, but they were so confident by that time they didn't put the explosion in this casket, just as you said, up in the air. It, it, it was a very nice sight. I was 18 miles to the west and uh, my friend, uh, Nobles was just about five miles to the south, and they had measurements from uh, ground uh, activity and balloons in the air and all types of things. But I watched the um, explosion go, the, the Trinity site. It is a very beautiful site, unless you're too close. <laughs> 18 miles, I was safe enough. But um, it's a very, very interesting thing, and we had various reunions, and it, the reunion in 93 was the 50, 50 year, and Teller showed up and wanted to give a talk, and maybe you know Teller was a big pusher for the supers. He made one statement at that meeting, it wasn't really necessary to have the supers and that's all he said. Now, you won't find that in print, I don't think. But uh, in a military standard point of view, I think why he said that is when you go in militarily, you just want to hit the military objectives and not do the whole area. So it was, was a very interesting project. And um, I hope we don't have it using very often anyway. Well, thank you for your time and listening. I see another veteran here in the audience, Walter Goodman. Are you interested in adding anything to these stories about your experience? No? Okay. Well, it's good to have you. Um, we have been taking oral histories for many years, and Walter is one of our first um, oral histories. And I remember him describing um, how many ships were in the Pacific. On the, I guess he must have been flying over it, but anyway, he described there was you could walk, you know, from deck to deck. That was as we were getting ready for the invasion. Um, any rate, I want to thank our illustrious panel. Are there any uh, questions that the audience might have of these um, veterans of Lhasa? We have a question here. Um, I have a statement from the University of Chicago, and these people weren't there, and I didn't hear one word of the first nuclear reactor built under the West Sand, and also that Leo Gillard, who I really fond of, worked with Fermi, and I helped them both with all kinds of miscellaneous work. And why you never mentioned the nuclear reactor, which is now a museum, museum piece out at the new Fermi lab outside of Chicago. 
That's the current question I have. Does somebody want to try to answer that? I don't, I think you've stumped us. I don't, yeah, <laughs> maybe, um, I, some of the question wasn't that clear. Well, the other question was, you never mentioned the first nuclear reactor ever built. You have to hold the mic to your mouth. In the West Stands Park. Oh, they didn't mention it. Oh, is that what you're pointing out? That yes, we because failed that's to what mention? we worked on. That's what Froman worked on. That's what the Lord worked on. Right, right. That's well, the only question I have. Okay, well, they, did anybody, I don't know if any of these gentlemen was with Fermi at uh, University of Chicago for the Stag Field reactor. I think they were too young, or they weren't involved with the Manhattan Project yet. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, this is a terrific start. Thank you so much. Oh, Bill, too? Bill, you'll have a chance now.